Hi, I'm Gary Stinson. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Voting Network. My guest today is Camilla Fox. She's the founder and executive director of Project Coyote, a national nonprofit organization based in Mill Valley, California, that promotes compassionate conservation and coexistence between people and wildlife through education, science, and advocacy. She has served in leadership positions with the Animal Protection Institute, Fur Bearer Defenders, and Rainforest Action Network, and has spearheaded national, state, and local campaigns aimed at protecting native carnivores and fostering humane and ecologically sound solutions to human wildlife conflicts. She's co-author of two books, Coyotes in Our Midst and Call of the Wild, and co-producer of the companion award-winning award -winning documentary Call of the Wild, The Truth Behind Trapping, and director and producer of Killing Games, Wildlife in the Crosshairs, a documentary film released in 2017 with the aim of ending wildlife killing contests in the U.S. So three things. First off, um, the phrase wildlife killing contest should not exist. Second, thank you for uh, your work in the world. And third, thank you for being on the program. It's a pleasure to be with you. So for the first question, I would like to take something from, the, from, from the, your organization's website. Since Europeans stepped onto North American soil, our native apex predators have been feared, misunderstood, hunted, trapped, and exterminated. Today, native carnivores continue to be marginalized, displaced, and persecuted in their homeland. Yes. Do you have a question around it? <laughs> Just can you can you respond to that? Can you can you take can you run with that? Sure. Well, um, unfortunately, I think uh, much of that sentiment remains true in the sense that we still, as a society, largely vilify our native wild carnivores. So when I say native wild carnivores, I'm talking about our coyotes, bobcats, mountain lions, bears. Uh, foxes, um, pretty much the animals that have virtually no protections by our state and federal agencies. So really, when we step foot on this continent, we view these animals as a threat both to livestock and also to the animals humans hunted for game. And unfortunately, that kind of prejudice and persecution exists to this day. And that's largely why Project Coyote exists. Um, as you mentioned, our mission is to promote coexistence between people and wildlife through education, science, and advocacy. A lot of that focus is working to try to protect these wild carnivores from the very persecutions they've been um, under assault for, for truly centuries since we, um, since humans settled this continent. So when you say apex predators, uh, what species are you talking about? Really for us, I'm talking about the ones that are largely unprotected. So as I mentioned, coyotes, wolves, mountain lions, bears, bobcats, uh, the native larger carnivores. Coyotes can be considered mesocarnivores in certain ecosystems, but they are apex predators in other ecosystems where they've sort of moved into the, the role of the wolf. But pretty much the, the larger wild carnivores that, um, uh, virtually have no protections whatsoever, and in many cases can be killed 24-7 in almost any method imaginable. So that, I, I don't know if, if it's wise to jump in this early, but, but when you talk about um, killed in every man, man, manner imaginable, can you talk about some of the, uh, well, we mentioned in the introduction wildlife killing contests, and that, that, horrifies me they exist. Can you can you talk a little bit about what those are, how prevalent they are, how prevalent they used to be? Tell us everything about them. Yes, yeah, so at its base level, killing contests are where contestants participate to kill the most or the largest of a given targeted species. And the species are often uh, animals that have no protection, so coyotes, bobcats, foxes, prairie dogs, um, even marmots and ravens and crows and rabbits and squirrels in some states. Um, prevalence, they unfortunately are uh, prevalent across the U.S. Um, we started researching the issue back in about 2012. We learned of a large coyote killing contest in Northern California in Modoc County, we were alerted by one of our supporters um, of a contest called Coyote Drive. 
we started to do some research and found out that the uh, contest extended into about four counties. And at the time, OR7, also known as uh, Journey, um, the one lone gray wolf who was traversing up in Northern California, was in that very area. And um, at the time, wolves were listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, our coalition then uh, petitioned to have wolves listed under the California Endangered Species Act. So we petitioned our Fish and Game Commission and said, not only is this egregious killing contest going on that is um, unethical, but also Journey was threatened um, by this very contest. And so ultimately, 18 months later, we convinced our commission to ban this practice in California. And in uh, December 2014, California became the first state to outlaw killing contests. But since then, we have researched the practice and we have identified that killing contests are pervasive throughout the U.S. And the more that we research, the more that we find um, they're happening all over. I will say that one of the, the issues is that because the species that are targeted have virtually no protections and can be can, killed in unlimited numbers, we really don't know how many killing contests there are, nor do we know ultimately how many animals are being killed in these contests. So when I'm interviewed by media outlets and they ask me, you know, so how many coyotes and wolves and, and mountain lions were killed in that last killing contest? We actually often don't know because states don't even monitor them. So that's really reflective of the bigger issue um, that's at play here. And that is that the species who are so often vilified and targeted in these killing contests are completely unprotected and so unprotected that they're not even deemed worthy enough to be um, monitored by our state wildlife agencies. So they don't even know how many killing contests often are going on or how many uh, given animals are killed in these um, these contests. And that implies that these, uh, if there are a lot of contests, that implies that a lot of people um, want to participate in them. Unfortunately, that is the case. And I will say the more that we research this, the more that we find um, more going on. Um, we have since that time of California banning the practice, we have formed a national coalition to end wildlife killing contests, very focused mission to end this practice nationwide. We now have 40 plus national and state organizations that are part of the coalition. And together, these coalition groups have banned the practice now in five states, uh, California being the first one, then Vermont, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, and Massachusetts. So we are um, definitely on a roll. Um, I often compare it to uh, dogfighting and cockfighting, which were once both legal in the U.S. And um, similarly, a national um, coalition and, and effort was underway, and it was a state-by-state -state effort. So as much as we would love to just pass a federal bill and ban this practice, the reality is it's going to be a state-by-state -state effort. And... Um, yeah, and unfortunately, the more that we, we look into this and dig into it and get onto different lists um, that these participants um, put out there and post on social media, the more prevalent that we find um, they are across the U.S. That's great. You've gotten five states to ban it. Yeah, well, I'm excited to say as well that there are several other states that are considering bans. And, of course, be before this whole pandemic chaos unfolded, we had several uh, states that were considering either legislation or rulemaking. Um, actually, upcoming in, in Colorado, uh, their state agency is considering a petition um, to ban the practice. So there will be um, a public comment period and an opportunity for uh, Colorado residents to weigh in. And then similarly, in, in Washington, their state wildlife agency is considering a rulemaking process on it. And then several other states are also looking into it. So I'm a real believer that um, once the domino starts on things like this, um, no state wants to be actually sanctioning such barbarity and cruelty. And I do believe that in our lifetime, we can actually ban this practice. So <clears throat> I don't know if you want to go this direction or not. And if you don't, that's okay. But I'm always interested when I talk to wildlife experts and people who uh, work especially those who love predators, about the, the sort of Western hatred of 
what's what what are some of the genesis of of the Western hatred of predators? And I want to say one thing, which is that I interviewed Ram Whitaker, who does a lot of work with uh, cobras in India. There's like I don't know, I remember the numbers, but it's like fifty thousand people die per year because of cobra bites. And when I was interviewing him, I was saying, so when you are educating people about this, do you do you run into people hating cobras, like people? And he knew about the Western United States hatred of wolves and predators. He's like, no, 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 no. We don't have that problem at all. They love the snakes. It's just that they need to, like, not walk around outside at night because they could get bitten. Or they need to put on uh, rubber boots before they go walk in the, in, the, in the swamp because otherwise they might get bitten. So he didn't have to deal with it. Even though there's 50,000 people die per year because of snake bites, they still don't hate the snakes. But in the United States, you know, there's never been a wolf attack that I, to my knowledge, a fatal one. And and in the United States, they still seem to hate wolves and have for a long time. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yes, absolutely. I, it's So it's deeply cultural. We, we started by talking about when European settlers uh, pretty much wiped out predators on the eastern seaboard. And then... As we moved west, we meaning settlers moved west, we encountered uh, the prairie wolf, um, which we now call the coyote, um, west of the Mississippi. And similar to the attitude towards wolves and other large carnivores on the eastern seaboard, we viewed coyotes as uh, a threat, um, as vermin, as something that needed to be eradicated. And in fact, as early as 1915, the federal government started getting officially involved in predator control efforts. And at that time, allocated uh, more than $200,000 to pay essentially professional hunters and trappers to go out and exterminate predators. And extermination was actually the articulated goal. And so we have, you know, many stories of um, these trappers who would pursue the individual wolves that um, escaped their leg hole traps and their snares and their poison baits. And um, and they would chase these individual animals until they uh, found them and killed them. And so that's ultimately how so many of our large carnivores, our grizzly bears, our wolves, uh, lynx, ultimately became um, extirpated in, in certain regions and vast swaths of the U.S., North America. So unfortunately, that persecution, that attitude, that prejudice persists to this day. And um, as we know, you know, our government has spent millions of dollars to uh, recover wolves in certain portions of their um, former range, and particularly in the Yellowstone area, <clears throat> spending millions of tax dollars to bring back wolves. And then ironically, the moment that they're delisted, removed from protections on the Endangered Species Act, we open up hunting seasons and trapping seasons on these very species. And even Idaho had one of these killing contests targeting both coyotes and wolves. So we are slow to learn. And um, I think getting back to your original question, this persecution and this, this attitude that these animals are vermin and something that we need to rid our landscapes of that unfortunately persists, even though the science over the last 50 or 60 years has shown us that having apex predators, having mountain lions, grizzly bears, wolves, coyotes on the landscape is important to healthy functioning ecosystems. Despite that knowledge, we continue, our federal government and state governments continue with lethal predator control programs. And that's the big problem, and that's one of the reasons why I started this organization to bring attention to that and also to try to really shift the way that we not only view these animals, but the way we, we treat them. So I have a friend who is retired from teaching at, um, at uh, University of New York in, in Binghamton, and they have a model forest there that is not doing well. And the reason the forest, and the, the, my, my professor friend loves, absolutely loves amphibians. And the reason the forest isn't doing well, and the reason the amphibians aren't doing well, is because there aren't any predators. And so there's too many white-tailed deer, and they eat the underbrush and destroy the habitat for amphibians, small birds, everybody else. So can you talk about some of the effects of eradicating predators and 
ecological effects of eradicating predators and then talk about uh, what happens when the predators come back. Sure. So you mentioned the issue of white-tailed deer overpopulation. And of course, um, especially, particularly on the east, I'm originally from Maine, so know the, um, the issues that many eastern states deal with with regard to white-tailed deer. And of course, there are overpopulations um, or, you know, the perception that they're overpopulated in areas um, is a result of a multitude of factors. And one is certainly state wildlife agency mismanagement of the species, um, allowing for uh, hunters to target um, big bucks with big antlers and then allowing the does to uh, often twin and, um, and breed. So there's the issue of management, but then there's also the issue of the fact that we have extirpated uh, the large carnivores who generally help to control and regulate um, ungulate populations, so deer and elk and other species. So we know this through science. We know that we have overpopulations of certain species because of the very fact that we have extirpated large carnivores in certain regions of the U.S., and yet that same persecution and that um, same uh, um, approach to wildlife management under the North American wildlife management model persists in most state agencies. And that's a whole other subject for probably another um, podcast. I could talk a lot about state wildlife agency mismanagement and history. But getting back to the issue of um, the ecology of predators and the role they play, so not only do they help to regulate populations of ungulates, but um, they're also great rodent controllers, particularly the coyotes and bobcats and foxes, the mesocarnivore species. And some of the more enlightened ranchers and farmers who we work with recognize this, and they recognize that having a family of coyotes on their land um, who they keep at bay through a variety of non-lethal uh, tools they get to benefit from the um, rodent ecological services of these um, carnivores. So, for example, one coyote can consume up to 1,800 rodents in a year, and that's a lot of a lot of um, ground squirrels and um, other kinds of rodents that might be problems for farmers and and uh, and ranchers. And of course, um, rodenticides have become a huge issue in the media. And we've recently had legislation in California to, um, to ban rodenticides because of, primarily because of their threat to, uh, non-native species, wildlife and raptors. Um, so by having the, uh, maintaining the natural predators on the landscape, we benefit, um, from their, their, uh, their, um, control of rodents. And of course, rodents have been in the news with Lyme disease and um, ticks. And so ultimately, indirectly, um, predators are also benefiting us by um, controlling disease transmission. So that's yet another free ecological service that they provide. And then another um, another one, uh, and this was some of the seminal work of um, Dr. Michael Soule, um, considered by some the father of conservation biology, who's on our science advisory board, and one of his students, uh, Kevin Crooks, they were studying uh, coyotes in Southern California outside of San Diego. And one of the things they found was that in the absence of coyotes in certain landscapes in these suburban urban areas, the mesocarnivore populations um, drastically increased. And so the skunks, the raccoons, the feral cats, foxes, those populations increased in the absence of uh, coyotes. And so um, as a result, the song and ground bird populations and diversity were significantly impacted. So to put it simply, when you don't have a coyote or a larger carnivore on the landscape, that can lead to an increase, a trophic cascade of another species. <clears throat> in this case, the mesocarnivore populations increased and then that negatively impacted the song and ground bird populations. And other studies have also showed negative impacts on the amphibian populations of these mesocarnivore increases. So those are just some of the ecological roles and, and impacts that we see with having um, large and mesocarnivore populations on the landscape. And again, that, that science is largely um, come to to the fore in the last <clears throat> 50 or 60 years. And yet, even though we know these things about the vital importance of these species, we still have government policies and programs that um, encourage 
uh, prophylactic killing of predators. And it's just really, really out of sync. So I've done, so I've, I've done I've, interviews um, on the red wolves and on uh, Mexican wolves and on timber wolves and on grizzly bears with the entire interview devoted to helping people to fall in love with them. So if you don't mind, could you, um, I've never focused on coyotes or on bobcats or on lynx. So could you take like four or five minutes for each of those and, and help listeners to, to fall in love with each of those, those creatures? Do you see what I'm trying to get at? <laughs> um, sure. I can do my very best. Um, <clears throat> I will share um, with coyotes that, I've mentioned that Project Coyote works on a variety of different uh, predator species, not just coyotes. And I'm often asked, why did we um, choose uh, coyote as our flagship or icon species for the organization? Especially knowing that there are bigger, sexier megafauna species like foxes, sorry, like wolves and mountain lions and grizzly bears that um, from a purely sort of optics um perspective and, and probably from a financial perspective in terms of raising money for a nonprofit um, would probably bring in more money. Um, but the reason that we chose the coyote as our flagship species is um, really threefold. One, the coyote is unique to North America. Unlike foxes and wolves that exist on other continents, um, we have this unique native song dog that has lived on this continent, dates back to the Pleistocene. In fact, uh, the Labrae tar pits in Southern California outside of L.A. Um, show that uh, coyote-like canid lived way back in the Pleistocene and is one of the very few species um, for the fossils that they found that still exists and did not go extinct like the other um, megafauna at the time. <clears throat> so coyote is unique to, uh, to North America. And then um, also when you look at the Native American lore, and the um, stories about coyotes um, from the eastern seaboard to the west and some of the fascinating characteristics and traits that different Native American tribes ascribe to coyotes. Um, many of the different uh, stories, you know, venerate them as um, ancestors, creators, tricksters. And so they were appreciated for their intelligence, for their adaptability, for their resilience, <clears throat> And I mean, it's so fascinating to really look at this because um, different tribes from, you know, east and west that never, never overlapped had similar characteristics and stories for coyotes. And then thirdly, um, the coyote, as I mentioned, is the most persecuted native carnivore in North America. And we estimate that at least half a million coyotes are killed every year in the U.S. alone. And that averages to about one coyote per minute. So as the most persecuted native carnivore, um, we believe that uh, if we can shift the way we view and treat coyotes, we can shift the way we view and treat all predators. So those are just some of the reasons why, as an organization, we chose the coyote um, to be our icon species. I've, so uh, <laughs> I've, known, I've known ranchers who um, would be just having a conversation about something else, and if they see a coyote, they immediately grab a gun and shoot. I mean, it's just without question. And I, that gets back to what we were talking about before, that I feel that's so cultural. You know, when you've grown up, and I've, I've met many ranchers out here, and I've learned a lot from spending time with, um, with ranchers and farmers. And when you've grown up and, you know, many generations where that's the thing you do when you see a coyote, um, best coyote is a dead coyote. That's the hardest part of the work that we're trying to do is, is we're, you know, deeply embedded in values, um, in norms and behaviors. And we know that those are the hardest things to change in humans. So, um, yes, unfortunately, that kind of attitude um, towards coyotes and other predators persists. Um, to me, it's something that's um, that's workable, changeable. Um, it's something that we're working on at a very deep level. Um, and I think that I'm seeing more and more ranchers and farmers uh, starting to appreciate the role of some of these animals, um, or in fact, working on a film, which I can talk about. But getting back to your original question, 
I just want to mention those stories that I, I um, shared from Native American tribes, the, the um, shared characteristics of um, creator and ancestor and trickster. <clears throat> I think that we have much to learn from coyotes, and especially at a time of massive social and ecological upheaval. Um, this species can tell us a lot and share a lot about what adaptability and resilience means. Um, you know, they have persecuted in the face of, of, um, or they have thrived in the face of immense persecution. And I think there's much to be learned from that aspect of this amazing species. So that's coyote. You mentioned bobcat and, uh, and lynx. Yeah, I want to go on with, with coyotes for just a moment longer, if that's okay. Sure. Um, two things. One of them is, uh, so what are, what are, can you be a bit more specific about some of the lessons you think we might be able to learn from them? And then I'm going to ask a basic sort of biological, ecological question about them. So I mentioned resilience. I do think um, coyotes are so adaptable. They now exist in most of our urban uh, centers throughout the U.S. Um, and they have shown to, to really exemplify what coexistence means. So even in the most densely populated landscapes, coyotes are coexisting side by side with humans. It's often us who really need to learn what coexistence actually means. So that's one of the things that I think we can learn from this animal. Um, most of the time, they really want to have nothing to do with us, and that's part of what um, Project Coyote does with regard to public education and outreach is dissip um, dissipating people's fears and uh, and really teaching them about um, basic ecology and, and behavior of these animals so that they can appreciate them, but not come into um, to conflict with them. Um, so those are just some of the, the aspects of coyotes. Um, I also want to just mention and give a shout out to Dan Flores, who's a Project Coyote ambassador, and he's an author of many fabulous books, but um, one of his bestsellers is um, American Coyote, and it's just a fabulous, fabulous book. Coyote America, sorry. Um, we have another film, American Coyote, um, Still Wild at Heart, both of which I recommend. Um, but his book is um, really goes into not only the history of coyotes on this continent, but sort of the parallels with the persecution of other wild animals and also um, the plight of Native Americans, because there was similar kind of um, war waged against uh um, the native people here, along with the uh, the native predators. So I highly recommend his book. So far as lessons learned from coyotes, it's people who know my work know that I wouldn't have written a language older than words without without having had interactions with coyotes. That really led to that book. Yeah. But anyway, so before we go on to to lynx or bobcat, could you just give some real basics on coyotes, like? What's the uh, what's the typical range? Um, how many babies do they have a year? Are they are they do they normally live in packs like wolves? Are they a different social organization than wolves? Um, so they are they can live as individual solo animals. Um, however, they generally seek out um, a mate, and a lot of people are surprised to hear that they generally pair, um, uh, create pair bonds for life. Um, so it's been documented with uh, bonds that last um, into their twilight years. And twilight years for a coyote can be similar to a dog of up to 12 or 13, though most coyotes in the wild don't last that long. Most are um, die from human causes, whether being shot or trapped or um, hit by cars in urban areas or rodenticides. Um, so they can live alone or in pairs. Um, sometimes they can be in small family groups, generally smaller than uh, wolf uh, family groups. But um, it can be two to six. Um, and then uh, for litter size, that can vary from um, generally between three and <clears throat> three and six. But again, we've seen upwards of 14 um, or as small as two or three. Um, but within the first year, 50 to 70 percent of that first litter will uh, not persist beyond their first year. So high mortality rate, um, which is fairly common across a lot of species. <clears throat> um, 
And their range can really vary. Um, they have very vast ranges in places like Yellowstone, where they've been studied for many, many years by um, Dr. Uh, Bob Crabtree, um, who's been with Science Project Coyote and runs Yellowstone Ecological Research Center. Fascinating studies coming out of that with um, looking at particularly the, the role of um, the introduction of wolves and how that impacted coyotes and their, their home range size, their, um, their litter size, um, really fascinating work. So then looking at coyotes in urban areas, they often have much smaller home ranges, um, sometimes as small as one or two kilometers, depending. And again, that goes back to their incredible adaptability. Um, the same with various diet uh, studies that have looked at their diets in urban and suburban areas. And that can vary tremendously. In some of the diet studies, we've seen that their diet is very much oriented towards their natural um, prey. Um, so rodents and rabbits and sometimes insects. Uh, fruit. Fruit is actually quite a prevalent um, diet component for coyotes in a lot of different areas. Um, and then uh, insects, small mammals, um, so true opportunistic omnivores and true, true generalists. And again, that gets back to their um, adaptability and, and true ability to live in almost any environment. So um, amazing animals that we have a lot to learn from. And one of the other things that we try to show people is they're so genetically similar to our dogs, you know, and, and we, we love and, um, and uh, spend billions of dollars on our, our beloved um, domestic canines, and then we vilify and, and kill their wild cousins in vast numbers. And we really try to sh point out that schism because it's um, when people get to know individual animals and when they get to know an individual coyote or wolf or um, get to have that experience, they get to see them as individual animals, just like our individual dogs and, and um, beloved domestic animals. So that's one of the things that we're trying to to share with the world is that these aren't um, villainous, dangerous animals. Um, they're in fact very similar to our dogs and, and so similar that they can interbreed. Not that we see um, <clears throat> a lot of interbreeding between dogs and coyotes, but they can. And, and what we are seeing, which is really interesting, is interbreeding of coyotes and wolves on the eastern seaboard. And there's a lot of research going on around that subject now and um, fascinating research that I think we'll have implications for management down the road because wolves are still considered a, a protected species in many states um, and yet coyotes are uh, have no protections and can be killed 24 7 in unlimited numbers in a number of states and so in terms of that interbreeding um, it raises a lot of management issues i will say that under the endangered species act unfortunately hybrids are not protected so those um, koi wolves, as some call them, un unfortunately have no protections whatsoever uh, on the eastern seaboard. Um, but again, just raising some fascinating <clears throat> of the species. Um, so can we can you can you sing the praises of bobcats for a moment? Because I don't think people talk enough about bobcats. Sure. Well, I will also share that I never had seen a bobcat until I moved out to California. And the first time I did was out in Point Reyes National Seashore. And I was just amazed. Um, you know, I even though I knew from my studies um, how small they were and until I really saw one in the wild, it was um, it was just kind of amazing to me of, of how small this this animal is. It's just a little bit larger than than a house cat um, for some of them. I will say that they vary in size, just like coyotes. Um, people are often just so surprised to hear that a Western coyote can be anywhere from 15 to 30 or 35 pounds, but they average about 20 pounds. So they're quite small. That's a coyote. And then the, the bobcat um, is similarly quite small. Um, and so um, they are uh, obligate carnivores. So unlike um, coyotes that are opportunistic omnivores, um, Bobcats and mountain lions need um, need raw meat. Um, they're also great mousers. So, you know, just like I mentioned, coyotes being a benefit to ranchers and farmers helping to control the rodent populations. Bobcats also fill a similar kind of role. 
And um, unfortunately, though, I will say that bobcats, like coyotes, have been persecuted across the U.S., um, often for their fur. And unfortunately, there's still a heavy market for <clears throat> bobcat and lynx uh, fur for um, their beautiful pelts, which are often sold to Asia and Europe. Um, and so people are often shocked to learn that bobcats are still commercially and recreationally trapped. Um, I will say that after we banned uh, uh, killing contests in California, our coalition then worked on ending bobcat trapping. And this started because a small group of residents in Joshua Tree in Southern California reached out to a number of organizations because they were concerned that their local bobcats were disappearing. And these were people who appreciated um, uh, these wild bobcats around the Joshua Tree National Park area. And they had seen them and their families year after year. And then all of a sudden they were disappearing. Well, research um, found that there were about one or two uh, fur trappers who were hammering the bobcat population and trapping them and, and selling them to auction. And at that time, the pelt prices were upwards of a thousand to twelve hundred dollars per pelt. So huge incentive to trap bobcats. And so ultimately that led to a whole grassroots effort. And just like our campaign to end killing contests, we had thousands of people in California who spoke out against trapping bobcats. And ultimately, um, uh, the legislature passed a bill, and then the uh, State Fish and Game Commission closed the loopholes on that, and ultimately we became the first state to ban bobcat trapping in the U.S., um, which is great, but unfortunately it still exists in many, many other states. Um, and so I think it's important that people understand that this is still an animal that is um, uh, highly persecuted and often has no protections like coyotes um, and can be killed in unlimited numbers. Um, that does vary by state. Some states have limits on the number of bobcats that, be ki that can be killed, but some don't. And so some actually target them in these practices. And I'll just share um, that recently in Texas, they had what was called the Big Bobcat Fest. Um, big bobcat pred uh, predator killing contest. And so over the course of several weekends, huge cash prizes, upwards of $40,000 were given to the teams that would kill the most bobcats or the largest, the big bob as they called it. And all across the whole state of Texas, um, these guys were out uh, trophy hunting bobcats. Most people are shocked to hear that. Um, you know, Cecil the lion, the uh, the beautiful lion that was killed in Zimbabwe by a dentist who um, uh, killed the animal with a bow and arrow. And that that story erupted a global, global outrage against the killing of this majestic lion for a trophy. And yet part of what Project Coyote tries to do is to point out that our wild lions, our bobcats, our mountain lions are also trophy hunted and often trapped in the U.S., and we are up against a lot of public ignorance around that, um, that these species are uh, killed um, legally and then sold um, to markets across the across the globe. So that's part of what we try to do. So bobcats, um, very important species ecologically, obviously a beautiful species, a persecuted species. Lynx, um, lynx are, uh, listed in most states as threatened, um, under the Endangered Species Act. Um, they are listed because of the very issues that I've mentioned, the persecution, the trophy hunting, the trapping that led to their extirpation in a number of states. I was part of a, a lawsuit, um, that we brought forward in, uh, in Maine, actually under the Endangered Species Act, and we argued that lynx were being um, uh, inadvertently um, killed in traps set for other species, so traps that were being um, purposely set to trap bobcats and coyotes and other species were incidentally capturing lynx, which is ultimately a violation of the Endangered Species Act. Similar lawsuits have been brought forward since then in a number of Western states, again, with the aim of protecting lynx uh, from the non-selective leg hole trap snares and other brutal traps that are still legally used out there. 
Um, so the lynx is still hanging on and still um, an imperiled species. Um, they are making a comeback in some states, but again, these very traps and poisons and other um, lethal devices pose a significant hazard to our uh, wildcats and our wild uh, canines. Well, before we wind down, um, I have a question about, about bobcats. Are bobcats as adaptable as coyotes in that do we see bobcats making their way into cities um, or are they, are they less, are they, are they more habitat specific? Well, it's interesting you, you mentioned that. I was just speaking to my father um, who lives <clears throat> in Golden Valley right outside of Minneapolis and he and his wife just saw a bobcat um, uh, right near their house the other day and they're in a, in a um, very suburban area. So we do see uh, bobcats in urban and suburban areas here in Marin County. Um, my neighbor actually recently saw a bobcat just up the hill, and I'm in a very suburban area. So they can persist in um, urban and suburban landscapes. I would say they're not quite as adaptable and resilient as coyotes, um, generally in lower densities. Um, but they have proven to be quite adaptable. Um, I do think that their numbers can be hit uh, heavily by trapping and other very directed um, killing practices. And that's been documented in, in scientific literature. So they're not as um, uh, able to rebound as quickly as coyotes. Coyote studies have shown that um, when coyotes are persecuted, whether trapping, uh, poisoning, um, government control programs, they can rebound very, very quickly. And this is through something called compensatory reproduction, where when there's a, a territorial void um, that's created when they're removed, they will fill that void very, very quickly. And whether that's from coyotes emigrating from around the area and refilling or from the existing coyotes that still um, haven't been uh, killed, they can um, increase their breeding. Uh, they can breed earlier. Um, they have all these different mechanisms that basically refill those um, those territorial voids. So that's a distinctive difference between coyotes and uh, and wildcats. You know what that implies to me? The fact that, and I've known that coyotes can do that, but what that implies to me is that nature knows how incredibly important coyotes are. And if there is a lack of coyotes, it knows that's an emergency and needs to bring some in. Well said, Derek. I completely think your assessment there is spot on. And the other thing, because we're often asked is, well, won't they exceed, won't they, they overpopulate an area? What we know through science is that if we leave them alone, if we stop trapping and poisoning and trophy hunting them, they will self-regulate. They won't exceed the biological carrying capacity of an area. And I think the most enlightened ranchers and farmers understand this. They know that if they don't continually remove that coyote family and uh, and let them establish their territories and defend those territories from other juveniles seeking new territories and new mates, they will reap the benefits of that coyote family through the, the natural rodent control, and they won't have to keep in this cycle of killing. Um, and that's by, you know, implementing a variety of non-lethal methods and basically, you know, showing the wildlife that we can coexist and my you know, my lamb or my chicken is not your next dinner because I've protected it with the proper um, non-lethal tools and guard, guard animals and predator-proof fencing, etc. So it's an interesting kind of, I see, um, evolution, if you will, of our understanding of these predators, why they matter, um, and how we can peacefully and safely coexist. So we have about five minutes left. So first, I, I have two questions left. One of them is, can you tell people more specifically about Project Coyote. Three questions. One, tell them more about Project Coyote. Two, tell them more about how they can help Project Coyote. And three, even if they're not going to help Project Coyote, how can they help coyotes themselves? Hmm. Okay. Well, um, as I mentioned, Project Coyote is national. <clears throat> We're a national nonprofit. Um, we do depend on uh, individual donations um, to keep doing our, our work for wildlife. Um, people can join by going to projectcoyote.org. They can become a member there. Um, they can also join our e-team there. By joining our e-team, um, you receive our e-alerts about different bills and, and actions to protect these carnivores. 
um, our e-newsletters, et cetera. Um, and that's right on our homepage, projectcoyote.org. And um, I'm sorry, what was your last, how they can, how they can help coyotes in their neighborhood or? Second would be, yeah. And third would be, would be um, in addition to, or I mean, it, in any case, how can they help coyotes and bobcats in addition to, to working with your organization? What can they do if they're in Texas and they want to oppose the big bob hunt? Um, they can work with you, but what else can they do? Well, I think always recognizing that you have a voice. Um, it's one of the things that we, I think, do really well is, is empowering people. All of our successful efforts in, in banning trapping and banning killing contests, trophy hunting, these have most often been grassroots efforts where people speak out, whether it's before a state wildlife agency, if it's a rulemaking process, or before their state legislature. I talk to legislators and commissioners all the time, and they want to hear from their constituents, and they are most impacted when they get a personal letter or they get a personal phone call or they get a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting when we can do that again, which will happen. So just I think people recognizing that they have a voice, um, especially when it comes to state uh, state wildlife management. Um, we like to try to get aware, away from the term management, conservation, and stewardship, but we all have a voice because ultimately these animals are held in the public trust. And that means that when there's an opportunity, when there's a state bill um, or a rulemaking process, we encourage everyone to get involved. Even in advance of that, contacting your state legislators and saying, I, I don't want my money spent on predator control programs or on killing contests or trapping. Um, so using your voice, and again, our action alerts will uh, orient people when there are bills and opportunities to weigh in on an issue. Um, and then also we have a program called our Coyote Friendly Community Program that's available. You can find out more on our homepage. But that is a community-based program where we work with citizens to do the kind of education and outreach that every community needs to help um, uh, basically raise awareness about why these animals matter and how we can reduce conflicts and appreciate them for all the myriad roles that they play and for their intrinsic value as well. So I have a couple more questions now, and we still have a minute or two left. One of them is, I know the first time I ever wrote a letter to the editor about an environmental issue, I was terrified. And the first time I spoke at a public meeting, I was terrified. And can you give someone who hasn't done it, but is it wants to, but is scared, can you give them some courage to, to say something for the first time? That's the first question. Absolutely. Well, I think we all have our, our comfort zone areas and then our places of discomfort. And um, I will just give a few examples for Project Coyote. We have so many people across the U.S. who volunteer with us. We are largely volunteer. Um, so much of our work uh, gets done because of these volunteers. And I have a number of our state reps um, who volunteer their time, three of whom I can think of right off the top of my head, who were terrified to do any public speaking, whether it was before a state agency or before a legislature. And I will say that part of it was practice. Part of it was writing down something that they felt good about, um, talking with peers um, through Project Coyote. We, we try to, through a whole variety of social media oh. forums, platforms, connect people, um, because I think connecting with others, um, there are like-minded uh, wildlife advocates out there, and I'm a big believer that that's how we can foment change is by connecting people um, and then energizing them and inspiring them. So I encourage people to, you know, to, to go beyond their comfort level um, and, you know, to reach out and work with uh, groups like ours and the volunteer network that we've created. And when you go to speak, take somebody with you. So when you get done and you're shaking, they can. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we have one of our speakers um, and our uh, wonderful people who's been with us for a long time, Kelly Hendricks, our Ranching with Wildlife Coordinator. When she started with us, um, she was terrified. And she's, uh, she's actually a cattle rancher with her husband who um, now teaches both rural and urban residents about why predators matter, how we can reduce conflicts. And she's gone from being um, a terrified public speaker to uh, so confident um, 
and just really comfortable in our own skin. And that one to practice, um, also working with, you know, a team, um, having the support, um, but doing it and doing it from a, a base and a place of meaning and wanting to make a difference. And I think that that mission driven um, passion is a lot of what we're about and a lot of what the people who come to us who want to get involved and join us um, are about. So I promise, promise, promise this is the last one, which is you you on the website, you talk about America's song dogs. Can you can you spend 20 seconds on the beautiful song of the coyote? Well, I wish I could give you the song of a coyote. Um, I actually recorded one two nights ago from my house here, and it was just such a beautiful song. But the Latin name for coyote, Canis latrans, basically means barking dog. Um, and, and the song dog, um, many Native American tribes recognize the uh, coyote as, as um, not only the trickster, the ancestor, the creator, but also um, the song, the song dog. And so that's really where that emanated from. Um, I really truly think that this animal has so much to teach us. And I will just share that here in Marin County, there is an 8 p.m. Um, howlin. And this is uh, just like in Italy where they did music, clapping in Spain to recognize the, um, the workers who are out there uh, on the front lines during this coronavirus pandemic. At 8 p.m. every night throughout Marin County, people step out and they start howling, coyote howling. And sometimes we've even heard coyotes and dogs joining and, and chipping in. So to me, it's a beautiful recognition of this animal. Um, it's also a recognition of community, of collaboration, of appreciation for um, everyone who's out there on the front lines. And uh, again, I think it's a beautiful thing that it's actually the coyote that's being recognized here in Northern California. Well, thank you so much for all of that, and thank you for your work in the world. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Kimla Fox. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.